Bueno, buenos días a... Good morning, everyone. I'm Jorge Jaime del Rey. I work as the general director for Democratic Memory. First of all, I want to thank Fernanda because we've had a little live situation and we haven't been able to load the presentations in advance, but all is well. So thank you, Fernanda, and thank you, Rom, for organizing the seminar. Um, this session is on victims' databases, and we're going to discuss the, what's been done in different uh, local and regional administrations and in academia. I believe there were two main reasons why a session like this had to take place. First, because we at the General Directorate feel it's only fair to listen equally uh, to all these institutions who've been working very hard on democratic memory in general and on victims' database in particular. Let us not forget that on the 10th and 11th legislatures, not a lot was done on this because it wasn't fostered by the state. And nevertheless, these institutions, whom we'll listen to now, they kept up their work. And second, I think it's also fair because they know a lot. They've got a lot to share. They've got uh, things we can learn from and uh, we can take good note of what they've been up to at, uh, uh, with the new uh, democratic memory law. So without further ado, I've asked the speakers to give us brief presentations, 15 minutes, so that in the end we can have time for discussion and questions. So first, from the Navarra Institute of Memory, we're going to have uh, Jose Miguel Gaston, who's head of the institute, and Cesar Layana, who's head of documentation. Good morning, Egunon. Good morning, Basque. First of all, we want to thank uh, EUROM and the general directorate their kind invitation to share with you what we've been doing we in Navarra and in other regional institutions. Uh, we all agree that the idea would be to all of us to come together in a single database for disappeared people, which I believe uh, would be ideal. So we're both going to speak, Cesar and myself will share uh, the presentation and we'll share the time we have. And then if you have uh, questions, we'll be delighted to answer you. The Navarra government has within it a department, the Department of Citizens Relations, and within it the General uh, Directorate of Peace, Living Together and Human Rights. In this General Directorate, there are two services. De memoria que es el Instituto Navarro de la Memoria, que es el que desde el año 2018, como os contaremos después, pues tiene las funciones de la preservación, la divulgación de, de la memoria de Navarra en torno a las víctimas del franquismo. Eh, además del el centro de documentación del Instituto Navarro de la if anybody needs interpretation into English, yes. There is another section, which is memory, uh, which deals with activities to do with uh, education and the homages that uh, are organized for Franco's victims in Navarra. Uh, what we're doing can be expressed as we can see it on screen in a circular flow. The mandate for the Navarra Institute of Memory to preserve memory leads to uh, agreements with different institutions in our region and outside it. We, are, we have contacts and agreements with the Ministry of Defense, with Largo Caballero Foundation, represented here by Almudena, the House of Memory 
of La Sauceda. So we're trying to uh, have as many contacts as possible within and without our territory. These contacts allow us to keep alive the memory in Navarra and to divulge it. We've been doing this, making the most of all the opportunities that IT uh, grants us and has been doing so for years, always with the goal of preserving and divulging our uh, memory heritage. In the case of Navarra, the work of systematizing all our archival information started in 2009 at the public uh, University of Navarra. They really started working in 2011 with an agreement with the Navarra Parliament. And then in 2015, this agreement uh, included also the Navarra government. The historical fund for memory of Navarra comes from the pioneering investigation of Jose Maria Jurio, which was carried out through a research group uh, which went from 1936. It was called From Hope to Terror. And it also had other contributions and private contributions and private uh, data that the group had access to so that the doc documentary fund for memory became one of the main databases for victims of violence from 1936, so Franco's years. Right now, we have 20, over 23,000 validated items around the main axis, which is the repression suffered by people. This is organized in different categories of repression with a solid conceptual foundation published by the fund and which is open to the citizens on our website. From 2018, the Navarra Institute of Memory was created in the General Directorate of Peace Coexistence and Human Rights, and we have the Documentation Center, which is in charge of preserving and divulging our memory heritage in Navarro. For this, we carry out complex interventions, or we do our best to do so, to make sure we can preserve our memory heritage. For example, the digitization and construction of virtual objects based on private and public archival fund, also through testimonies and through the creation of a big portal presenting this memory heritage. This is how Oro y Videa, the path of memory, appears as a portal. The idea is to have in this single portal all the complementary projects which have been developed in Navarra over the last few years. The database that I mentioned before, the funds that we have been gathering at the Navarra Institute of Memory since 2015, the graves uh, map, the prospection and exhumations uh, studies, and uh, bibliographic uh, search engine that we have implemented. This is what we're hoping to achieve by 2023, and the project is being carried out with Dedalo. Right now in our portal, Oro y Videa, we have the Oral Memory Fund with over 50,000 interviews, and this year we will have integrated the virtualized documentary fund which is now held in a different online space. By 2023, we will integrate all the different projects I mentioned before, which are now being carried out in Navarra. This integration, uh, I'll give you a brief summary, is done in for two different reasons. First, we're trying to answer the four main principles of humanitarian international law, justice, reparation, and guarantee of no repetition. For the Navarra Institute of Memory, to give uh, the names of the victims is a way of answering to these three principles, while our divulgation projects, such as shows and educational projects, which are posted on our portal online, are an attempt to foster the idea of no repetition. And then we also want to place the victim at the core of the project. So all the documentation pivots around the victims. So we want to 
always show the primary sources of information. In a way, we are inspired in the Jarlsen model that we heard this morning. I mean, we are a lot more humble, but they are our inspiration. Around the main axis of the victim, we gather all the information in whatever format they may be available. The integration means that they're available in one single database and we can access online data coming from four different institutions with the creation of a unified victim registry. We also heard Argentina talking about it this morning. In Navarra, we do not want to have four different databases. We want to have a single one with all of the data from all the institutions. And also having a uh, model uh, for data with the victim at the core. So we are following archival principles, origin, for example, but we also treat the data relating it to a victim. Yeah, may I now explain what we've been doing over this year, which we're finishing, and what we want to do in 2023. By next month, we will have finished part of our project. As Josemi was saying, uh, we will have already have the testimonial collections. And uh, by the end of the year, we will have finished the change of data model to guarantee the import of data from uh, databases which are our own or belong to other centers. We have now also integrated the repertory of deadly victims, over 3,000. We have also proceeded to, no, we will uh, by the end of the year, publish the documentary funds which we had gathered from agreements with private inst uh, people and institutions. And we have also linked all that documentation when it is uh, related to victims, uh, people who were murdered, who lost their life and who have all the data related to them. Now, in, within the idea of reparation, the Navarra Institute of Memory had carried out some census programs. One is the census of the exile, another one the census for deportation, and another one the census of people affected by economic repression. These databases will also become part of the system. Now, next year, 2023, we will integrate the rest of the victims of the documentary fund of the University of Navarra, some 20,000 items, the geo-referenced information from the grave maps. They will also integrate the exhumation data from the scientific body, which now holds it. And we will link this all to victims in as much as possible as we digitized and virtualize all the information. In the first stage, uh, which we have already finished, we will have all those 3,000 items from the UTNA and the three census. And with all that information, we have the basis for this unified victim registry. This is after an adaptation which we will use in the future for all the other integrations of the uh, data uh, model in Dedalo, which is the platform we're using. So right now we have nearly 6,000 personal uh, fact sheets appearing in this victim's registry, around which we have indexed pictures, documents, audio and visual files and also bibliographical searches in around uh, 40 works on the repression after the coup d'etat and Franco's repression in Navarra.
The information is recovered mostly through searches uh, by name or municipality, although we also have the option through controlled vocabulary of searching by uh, themes. Let's have a quick look at uh, some screen grabs to show you what you can find in our portal, Oro y Bidea, the path of memory. The idea is that this portal will focus on a user-friendly uh, search. It should be intuitive, easy to handle. So there are other elements to do the searches, but the main axis is the search by name, municipality, or even theme. Now, this access to information can be achieved in a more sophisticated manner through an advanced search of mortal victims, economic repression victims, so in the different uh, senses of origin. And we can also search by uh, town or by theme. We can also access the uh, raw sources. So we have archival sources, which are both private and public, which don't always refer to uh, victims that we have in our unified register. And the researcher will always have access to the whole of the fund. I insist we have digital funds. We have agreements for digitization and virtualization. We do not, we are not the holders of the physical fund. We are often mediators between the source fund and the user. And another resource is through maps, which allow us to do geo referenced visualizations. Let's have a look at the victims' uh, fact sheets. Here we link certain main fields, and then we give access to all the information that is referenced to that person, be it uh, publications, fragments of interviews, pictures, whatever. With this, the idea is that we can then um, uh, manipulate the information and create, for example, biographical paths. This is uh, an example of how, using uh, these data, we can reconstruct uh, the areas of repression suffered by this victim. And we have links to all these landmarks. Would you like to finish? We can open up uh, maybe uh, uh, no, some questions later on. I would like to talk about five conclusions of this project, which integrates the totality of the information in different uh, institutions having to do with the Coupe d'Etat uh, region. And in that respect, Navarre is offered as a memory laboratory which can be interesting to some. We would like to point out that this approach is quite innovative in the treatment of, of information. We uh, underscore the user experience to guarantee the right to approaching justice um, of both victims and, and relatives. And I would like to insist, as you could see uh, this morning, that the fact that the model, the data model focuses the victim in the center of it all allowing to have uh, different information through the primary sources. These dissemination projects that we are participating in right now allow us to incorporate new people in the knowledge of the past. And, uh, this has been the case in our experience. And the creation of this unified register of victims, registry of victims that we are reaching, and has to do with a posterior research and the potential of uh, new uh, dissemination materials that are uh, giving us or yielding us uh, very good results. And finally, I would like this portal with all the material that is generating and with all that is generated in the future can turn into a place of uh, historical memory in Navarre, implementing uh, the latest uh, law that we are working on, 
currently monuments, uh, common graves, uh, etc. But this should become, uh, this portal should become historical memories uh, site having to do with the victims of uh, frantism and the civil war. Run out of time, and maybe we can open up a, a further Q&A session. Thank you. <clears throat> well, thank you so much, uh, Thyssen and Josemi. To tell you the truth, you're doing an excellent job. Uh, we've been collaborating with you. Uh, for quite a long time with respect to the census of victims, but we've been uh, working closely with Navarre, reviewing uh, the, the common graves and, and all the information that you have in your region is, is incredible. I would like to point out the last thing you said. These uh, works uh, ultimately turn into memory sites. And own right, the only thing these people may have uh, in, at the end will be that database. The, the more details we can put into this, the greater the recuperation of the memory of the pill of this person will be. Let me give the floor now to Xavier Bouchero Alonso from Nomes Voces, uh, Names and Voices project. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. This is a project we have in Galicia, which was the basis of many studies, but that is not going to continue into the future. I will tell you how this was created, how we can use the funds uh, Uh, how this can be used, uh, how, how it can be used by any user. Well, here we have it. First of all, I would like to uh, thank uh, the invitation of the European uh, Archive of uh, Memories. I'm very pleased to be in physical touch with these guys with whom uh, some years ago we had uh, some very interesting uh, work sessions in Galicia. We went to Coruña. Uh, prison in worse conditions than now. We had to wear helmets. We lived an incredible experience. We were attacked by a seagull when we were going to Coruña. Well, we escaped. We never stopped. And the seagull chased us for a while, but later on it just flew away. Well, Nomes e Voces, Names and Voices Project, gathers uh, the ensemble of the victims uh, that we have in the four provinces that currently are part of the autonomous community of Galicia. These victims, it's important to say that we don't consider them victims of the civil war because in civil, we didn't have a civil war. We had a coup d'etat on the 20th of July. It succeeded and uh, it's not a war front. Even so, in our territory, we have between 4,500 and 5,000 victims. Some of them have not been validated. It's a figure though that it can uh, well, go between these two figures. The victims, because we uh, all had a coup d'etat, belong to the uh, violence of, of the uh, putsch. It was uh, not the... Uh, uh, Nomes de Voces was born uh, as a project on the year 2006, considering the dynamic of the uh, recuperation of, of the historic uh, the history memory. At the moment in which uh, the popular party was not in the government in Galicia, because when we had Alberto Núñez Feijó and the MPP won uh, in, in Spain, Nomes de Voces ran out of money and we can continue working as in the past. This does not mean that the results have not been uh, updated or have not we have not worked that uh, in such a way that corrects some of the problems that the database uh, has. But it's true that it hasn't, we have not been able to approach uh, gen more general instances as we should have done. 
what do we have to do for the future? Well, for the future, we have two databases. First, this one is called Terra Memoria. You have the link. You can uh, uh, check part of the online uh, information. We have to go to Santiago. And it's a database that uh, is an oral basis with 2,000 interviews. 2, uh, 1,500 are focused, or 500 are focused on uh, the civil war, the coup d'etat, etc. The rest belong to other f previous funds called Istorga Fund and East America Fund. And they supply information about other topics like migration, world history, but they focus on the uh, coup uh, violence. It's a very important source for its analysis. But in any case, interviews of both Nomes de Boces, which is half of the project, that's why it's called so, currently can be checked through this portal, which gathered the work, the previous work of the three funds. Uh, names, for example, we have a database, which this is a snapshot of what you can see when you connect with the link. And uh, a person that enters here includes, oh, we can see all this information, reports, maps, picture galleries of victims or places that included violence. And then they have the possibility of going to the database of victims, clicking on the blue button you can see right on the middle. And if, uh, if this is done, this person will be able to find the complete list, the full list presented alphabetically or filtering any of these items you can see, you can use one or several items combined. The complete or the full list of victims we have validated in the public database, well, it's approximately 15,949 victims classified alphabetically as well as uh, under any other criteria, name, last name, date of birth, place of birth political uh, orientation, profession, and, and the year of death. People who were uh, who died, and we know the, the, the date of their death. And then the event, the death of violence this person uh, went through. And in this, cha in this chart, you see the number of victims with respect to the event. And here, I think uh, it is important to explain what some of these uh, events are. Uh, Gulag uh, and, and, and well, the camp of extermination, people from Galicia that ended up in these uh, detention and extermination centers, no matter whether they survive or not. We believe that they are there or they were there because the well, uh, the, the coup uh, took place, and otherwise they wouldn't. Have, they were victimized by the by other authorities. Then we have unknown. There's one victim that should be eliminated, but it's just one person, exile in Galicia. Not only for people who went to uh, the exile, but it's a category that we had to uh, leave with, uh, leaving non completed in the the uh, base the database of. Galician culture, there's a, uh, enough, another database that includes more information. And the rest of the categories having to do with 99% of the victims. First of all, we have several categories that have to do with the different types of uh, deadly victims. It's, well, uh, it's a paseo, it's a, an execution without the sentence, execution inside or outside of Galicia. Disappearance, this is surprising. Uh, just uh, such a small amount of people. This is one of the uh, conclusions that we uh, got from the research from Nomis Ebothes in Galicia. We realized that at the moment of creating this database, or from even before, victims uh, were identified, most of them. And then finally, we have that list of other types of death. It has a more heterogeneous nature. People who died uh, during the fight, uh, the first moments of the fight, in the active armed resistance acting against uh, the coup uh, authorities, people who committed suicide, uh, who, people who died because of the tortures, etc., or people whose deaths can be considered non-programmed, but definitely uh, 
that had a responsibility from the coup authorities. Then we have five other events that do not involve the death of the person. I forgot to say one thing, though. In any of these events, a person can only appear in one event. I mean, if we have a person who was executed, he or she will not be in prison, even if uh, he or she first was uh, uh, retained in, in prison during the moment of its or his uh, or her death. Uh, arrest or detain people who are detained in prisons or concentration camps without having correctly judged prison people who were uh, condemned to different in days or years of incarceration then we have a process people who who were uh, sued formally but who were not condemned either because they were not uh, present in in, in in the trial because they uh, they had saved or they were in the exile or because they were absolved and their cause was uh, cancelled and uh, then we have uh, punishment people who well, bailed uh, who were, didn't go to jail or who were not killed and then other repressive typologies group quite a heterogeneous group where we have, uh, as an iconic case, women who were forced to drink um, certain types of oil, uh, who were tortured, forms of violence that do not involve death, but it's impossible to, to include in any of the other categories. And uh, just to finish and to allow some more time for debate and to be able to, to answer the different questions. Let me tell you what uh, were our conclusions for the, our research uh, of, of the future, which is the thing that is most interesting for us. Well, number of victims. Nomes de Bothes allowed uh, to obtain in Galicia a number of victims, which was quite real, even if the project was uh, or finished in the year 2012. Well, it hasn't gone through uh, meaningful changes. And with the respect to these victims, it's interesting to state that before the base uh, was created, people thought that uh, 10,000 people were affected, but if we had uh, 5,000 or less, it was quite surprising. This may mean uh, a problem. To some, some people thought that uh, the magnitude of violence was not so important. But killing for 5,000 people is is quite terrible. It means that we had more deaths in Galicia than in Chile during the 1973. Beyond the quantification of victims, numbers de both this limited some myths and some uh, references that were quite inexact. With respect to the re Franco's, with respect to Franco's repression, the chronology of the uh, assassinations, which allowed us to to eliminate the thesis of uh, the hot crisis, uh, hot executions, both executions and paseos, which meant taking uh, people into a car and then being killed in uh, a forest, for example. So we had many sources that prove the different uh, steps followed by the uh, authorities at the time to kill these people. So they were not something that was done. Uh, uh, it was not an uncontrolled type of violence. Another interesting piece of information that allowed us to compare this with other contexts and places beyond uh, Spain has to do with the social and political profile of victims because well, it was proven that violence affected different uh, social strata and different professional strata beyond the worker, the working class of cities. So it's important to know that both this nomes de both this evidence that violence affected the, the working liberal working classes and military people that do not support 
the uh, the coup d'état that were some of the first people to be killed by the uh, insurgent party. Uh, this cannot explain uh, the. the well, uh, well, uh, uh, there's no relation between a political uh, relevance or a political and, and, and uh, or pertinence. The territorial area of the, pro of the persecution, violence is not affecting all municipalities equally in Galicia. Uh, villages are highly scattered and now uh, the rural areas are quite abandoned. But here we don't have a population, a population distribution with the distribution of deaths. This means, or this explains, why there was an overestimation of violence. We knew more about the municipalities where we had seen more deaths. If you go to the database, if you check the maps that we have prepared, or simply if this is filtered by municipality, we can see that Deaths are concentrated in certain municipalities, Vigo, Ferrol, Coruña, and Ourense, with other places where it is not possible to determine a single person that was killed or, or maybe one. This is a, an interesting reality beyond uh, the interest of documenting where the different victims to, uh, appeared, because this allows us to determine the idea that violence was some simply uh, 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 one more resource to guarantee obedience through coercion and terror. And finally, I wouldn't like to, to use any more time, but the data we have right now, even if they have stopped uh, in the year 2012, uh, well, this helped us to, to do uh, several lines of research uh, Uh, including a master's uh, papers, uh, PhD thesis, etc., which allow us to correct the violent events that, that these people went through, but also to reach other general organization of, of violence and shed some light on groups that were traditionally forgotten in the studies about a coup violence like those that generated violence uh, and the role that society had or the role played by society at the time and and in democracy to, to end with a positive note because to tell you the truth most of the society no matter uh, what people say that we all were guilty most of the society did not participate in these violent events that's all i had to say Thank you very much for your kind attention. Muchas gracias, Javier. La verdad es que hay un trabajo muy interesante. Very interesting job, Javier. All these final conclusions that you pointed out with respect to the elimination of some myths are extremely interesting because ultimately this uh, what uh, research helps us with some of the preconceived ideas had very little basis on, on reality. This is fantastic work. Uh, it's unfortunately uh, due to the, your lack of research you had to finish in the, in the year 2012. And it's a point to point out, maybe we can debate it, uh, the fact that these projects that we are reviewing uh, are projects that are uh, alive and, and, and kicking. They have to be taken care of from the different institutions so that we can uh, answer questions and more, more modestly, like my colleague Jose Luis, we, we answer many requests from the Secretary of State. And all these uh, elements uh, need to be uh, examined. If we just park them in a corner, we'll lose a source of information. And victims won't be uh, taken care of. Uh, as it's five in total, we'll change uh, uh, the other speakers, and we don't, we cannot. Bueno, pues en primer lugar en esta segunda parte. Well, in the second uh, table, we'll have Ainhoa Campos, subdirector of the project Memoria Democrática the, from the University of Castilla-La Mancha. Ainhoa, you have the floor. Is it on? Yes, it is. Well, good morning. 
Uh, and thank you. I'm so pleased to be here. Thank you for your kind invitation. And thank, I'd like to thank the organizers because organizing an event is always difficult. And this one is brilliant. I'd like to introduce to you what we've been doing in the original plan of studies on the Prague memory at Castilla-La Mancha based on other projects that uh, were, that had to stop due to lack of resources, something we should talk about in the Q&A session. And all we did, gathering all that information, is to improve or to add other elements. It's, a, it's an ongoing process. First of all, as our Galician friend said, some characteristics of repression in Castilla-La Mancha. Well, in the figure of mortal victims is terrible. The last uh, the figures is 12,597 mortal victims. Considering the population of this uh, region was huge. These victims are divided into different chapters, extrajudiciary uh, victims, others that were received the death sentence, uh, deaths in, in, in prison. 2,352, 529 people who died in Nazi concentration camps, another aspect that was recently added. And we also will have the, the, the addition is not 12,597 victims. We have victims from or due to other causes, as our colleague from Galicia said. I'm not going to, to talk about that, but we reach a, a total figure of 12,597 victims, which involves many different things for the provinces integrated in Castilla-La Mancha, and a great job for when we intend to prepare uh, a database of uh, common graves and uh, both of the victims themselves. What are the uh, uh, common graves? Uh, well, mostly in cemeteries, in graveyards, because as you we could see, most victims were killed after a sentence or in jail. Further on, they were buried in cemeteries particularly in places devoted to the burial of people who had not been baptized, people who had committed suicide, normally called El Corral de los Desgraciados. Um, and this is where most uh, victims of the Franco, Franco repression were buried. This should facilitate our work of identification of victims. And well, it's so because we have the books, the reference books in cemeteries, but these books do not contain reliable information. In many occasions, uh, the amount of people that were buried is minimized, and uh, well, the uh, historical parkers of these graves make it difficult to find some of them. But on the other hand, in this slide that I showed you before, we have the uh, graves in by the sides of the roads, in some areas, in some trenches in Castilla-La Mancha. It's hard to find places. This is La Fosa de Recos in Toledo, in the middle of a, uh, a olive tree field, uh, uh, an old olive tree field. And it was hard to find because victims, with the acceptance of the owner of these territories, had signaled the place and they had built uh, a, well, a monument that showed that allowed us to, to uh, exhumate some of the uh, victims. What happened during the during Franco Frankism? Some of the victims were affected by these uh, changes uh, and transfers to El Valle de los Caídos. That in previous congresses should call it Cuelgamoros instead of. It was the previous name, 1,123 uh, people were sent to Cuelgamuros, placing uh, Castilla-La Mancha as the sixth region that more people transferred to Cuelgamuros. And this involves not only the transfer, as we know, of victims of Republican repression, but also victims of the Frank of Franco's repression. So these graves were exhumated at one moment in time in order to take these uh, remains to Cuelgamuros, uh, where other clandestine exhumations took place there. During the transition, the democratic transition, other exhumations uh, are called non-scientific exhumations because they didn't follow a pre-established protocol where uh, well, the remains uh, were not going to be identified. And this entailed the creation of new memorials, which added the names of the victims. Problem. At times, 
as uh, there were not scientific exhibitions and they were only using that information coming from the burial reg uh, or cemetery registers, register books. Uh, they have more names than people, people who were killed in that place but not buried in that place. So, well, this makes the whole story very complex. Once in the year 2000, 2003, 2012, when public memory policies were deployed, we had to understand between the year 2003 and 2012, we had scientific exhumations that had a great importance in Castilla-La Mancha and that helped uh, find out that these books uh, of uh, cemeteries didn't yield reliable information. They, therefore, they supplied some faulty information. So as we heard before from 2011, with the change of government, both in state and in our region, our funding uh, was halted and so was our work. So in by 2012, there were no more exhumations because we ran out of money. So there was a paralyzation of the democratic memory efforts that were trying to identify these mass graves and these victims. This halt. Uh, lasted in state until 2020. But in 2016-17, the uh, Ciudad Real County Council took the initiative of funding some memory projects where they uh, started to try to identify the victims that laid in these graves in Castilla-La Mancha. And the University of Castilla-La Mancha uh, created a research group. Started, they started studying what had happened in Albacete and then in the other provinces of Castilla-La Mancha. And this led to a portal called Victimas de la dictadura, dictatorship victims in Castilla-La Mancha. You can see there are all sorts of victims, not just the deadly ones in uh, the autonomous communities, the victims from Franco's period. To this, we have to add the project funded by the Ciudad Real government, Maps of Memory, which tries to name all the Franco repression victims in Ciudad Real, the mortal ones as well. So please visit this portal, Memory Maps. It's really interesting. It is then when in 2021, the regional study plan on democratic memory was created. With this, we tried to gather and organize all this information, which had already been drafted by our colleagues in years before. We've published a series of books, we did so last year, on important subjects to do with the civil war and Frank because times we've created a portal which is called Regional Map for Democratic Memory. You're welcome to visit it. We have a regional map of mass graves and victims, or the graves and victims, you can have a look at it. And then another area where you can see explanation of important events in the area, in Franco's times, and what we call the interactive map for democratic memory in Castilla-La Mancha, where you have a combination of the graves map and the geolocated information for the main events of the Civil War, Franco's periods, and we are also now beginning to cover the transition years in Castilla-La Mancha. Now, the project started last year. For three months, there were five of us, but then in 2022, which is the current year, there are only two of us. Now, we are going to have two more colleagues join us and uh, one of them will deal exclusively with the organization of all the data we have for these victims. Um, we tried to do that last year together with the Secretariat for Democratic Memory and uh, with the very scarce uh, sources and, and funds and people we had, we managed to work already on the map with, I believe, 122 graves in Castilla-La Mancha, and we now have 193 graves located in Castilla-La Mancha. We believe that this uh, is all of the graves that we know of right now. I mean, some data needs to perhaps be polished. Jaime and I were talking about it before. But yeah, we believe that the graves uh, data is quite updated. 
Now, victims, that's a different kettle of fish. That's much more complicated. We don't have the human resources to do this. But we've begun to update the victims linked to each grave. We thought that would be the easiest way to systematize the information. And uh, the colleague who worked on this last year for two months managed to update the list of victims linked to the graves in Ciudad Real, particularly the ones that uh, were less than 100 victims in that mass grave because of the little time he had. Now, this is linked to another project because at the same time as we are updating the identification in number of the victims linked to each grave location, we are generating a copy of the same program to offer it for regional uh, public so that we can have a whole regional map, not just provincial. There is still a lot to be done. Now, we hope to have funding for some time now, and that will be of help. And we'll continue updating the state map of graves with victims linked to each grave. And we will also have this copy for the regional government so that we can at least systematize everything that's to do with the mortal victims because in previous projects, all these other categories of victims were taken into account. But we want to break them down so that it is clear how many people died as a result of Franco's repression in our region. And I believe that's that. I wanted to finish, if I may, with a couple of uh, challenges we are finding and we hope to solve in the future if we are to deal with this matter. And it is that to do this national census of victims, where we work with the census of, census of the different regional communities, we have to bear in mind that sometimes only exhumations can give us the final data we need on victims' identity, the victims in the different graves, because sometimes the written reports are falsified or they don't have all the information, and the oral sources, unfortunately, are disappearing. And then we see that we need to unify criteria. This is crucial to have a regional and then national census. We need to check whether we are counting the victims executed in or coming from, and we need to make sure we're on the same page so that uh, we can work in an organized way, both for the national map of uh, grave and the uh, census. That's all from me. If you have any questions, I'll be around. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Ainoa. Thank you, Ainoa. I believe that in Castilla-La Mancha, what you're doing is pretty amazing, particularly because you've done it in not a lot of time. You've started recently, and you're doing a lot. It's true that, as you say, the exhumation policy needs to be recognized as a priority. We believe that is the case from the Secretariat of State, and part of our budget, around 60%, is for that. And also the new Democratic Memory Act means that we can proceed to do the exhumations directly when there are certain uh, conditions which mean that we cannot have contributions from the the cities or the regions. And yes, we need to unify criteria for uh, to unify our work. We are now at an analytical stage where, uh, I mean, it could be construed as a paralysis, but I think it is important to analyze things first. This is strategic. We need to stop, take stock, and then proceed to building the national census rather than do it in a haphazard manner. So, Victor Manuel Ramiro Pérez, who is a researcher, researcher on sexual dissidents. He works at, uh, as general directorate for diversity in the government of Canarias, in the Canary Islands. Thank you. Good morning, all. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you to the 
uh, European Observatory for the Memory for their kind invitation. Thank you to the University of Barcelona and the Secretariat of State for Memory. You can see in the picture Manuel Alfonso. This is a carnival in the Canary Islands in the 60s, more or less. This clearly um, breaks the uh, uh, sexual binary and code. And next to that, there is a jail, the CIA, where many homosexuals were incarcerated just because they were expressing themselves like Manuel Alfonso used to. He didn't go to that jail, but he went to other jails in the islands because of his sexual dis uh, dissidents. The Canarian uh, law in 2005 and the current law 2022 for democratic memory uh, cover uh, these cases, LGTB people, dissident people, as we used to call them, as victims of Francoist repression. During the dictatorship, repression mechanisms, the repression mechanisms were very varied. There were legislative uh, repression through the Act for uh, Malfesants, uh, the Criminal uh, Act for Public Scandal, or even another uh, regulation for the protection of women, for example, which was used against many lesbians. So we're talking about a, a mechanism of repression which was very varied, heterogeneous. Now, based on this legal framework, and particularly the legal framework in the Canary Island, because uh, the strategy comes before the current legislation, we in the Canary Island decided to develop this uh, strategy for uh, memory. We have three main pillars. The first one, research, research on repression. This research for years uh, was not of the interest of academia or public institutions. Luckily, over the last few years, we've had some young researchers interested in the subject in different parts of the Spanish state. And also, the institutions are now showing an interest. We've done some research work, uh, hiring people directly. And the idea has been to gather material which could be historically relevant. We've cataloged everything and placed it at the disposal of different uh, archival sources, which I'll mention later. This is quite a new project. We started in 2020, so under three years. The first thing we thought of was that we needed to gather the testimonials of older LGTBIQ people because their own testimonials were soon going to disappear. In fact, uh, Alfonso, I had the pleasure of interviewing him f for my book, and, and he died a couple of years ago. So, you know, those testimonials are about to disappear. So. We'll see later how these interviews were became part of the archive of memory. Apart from direct research, we also try to make sure that there is a research on memory. We have agreements with the University of La Laguna. They have uh, the research center for LGTBIQ studies, and they're going to work on memory, amongst other things. And we have specific funding for Canarian universities for research projects on this. The second pillar of our strategy is the divulgation, the popularization of our memory through different products. Some of them have already appeared as a result of our research, or there are other parallel proposals that I'll mention at the end. The third pillar is the memory archive, on which I'll uh, expand later. And the idea is not to make it a single archive. We want to multiply the spaces where these materials are available. Now, 
uh, to start with, we thought that the main space for the material we wanted to gather had to be the provincial historical archives as institutional spaces which would give these funds uh, stability, preservation, and ease of access. So it would be a way of making sure that the material would be const always available. And in these historical archives, particularly in Santa Cruz de Tenerife, there is a specific research line for a sexual divergence memory where all this material is going to be placed. And left open for researchers. And then we have our portal uh, within uh, the website of the government of uh, the Canary Islands, where all this is going to be posted and it's going to be open to whoever has an interest for it. This is not a victim's database. Uh, you know, sexual dissidence is something very specific. It is to do with people's private life. It's to do with fear. I mean, all the people are still fearful of expressing their sexual dissidence despite the time that's gone past after the dictatorship. So we're not considering a victim's database, but rather we just want to gather the testimonials of the people who wish to express themselves. As part of our research, we are now drafting an agreement with the University of the Canary Islands so that they can have these materials on their website, which is the digital memory of the Canary Islands. It's part of the university's website. Within the website of historical memory for the Canary Islands, in the vice, uh, for the vice councillor of justice, this uh, memory web has different sections. This is sexual dissidence. Uh, this is people by the data that we have been researching. We have uh, testimonials, audio, video, legislation, and we have a link that takes us to everything to do with uh, the strategy for historical memory. Now, what do we have in our specific web? for uh, sexual dissidents. Well, we define the strategy, the goal, what it contains. We explain what the historical memory uh, digital archive uh, is. And uh, we explain the research methodology, the, theoretic, the theoretical basis, how we gathered our data, and all the bibliographical references. And the names of the people who are part of the team. Uh, obviously, all the conceptual work was done in advance, and we also post here all the interviews, the main stages, uh, bibliographical references, uh, all the important gatherings we participate in, etc. Within, uh, as part of the interviews, over the last few years, we've obtained 39 interviews with LGTB people, residents of the islands older people, but there is this obstacle of people who are fearful. Many people just turned us down. They said that they did not want to remember, they did not want to come out. Um, we will post those interviews. The picture you have there is from Hierro Island, a tiny island where we have these two people, Adela and Nacho. They are mother and son. She is lesbian. Uh, she lives with her partner, and he's a, a gay man. And they've told us about their experience in a rural space in El Pinar uh, village, which is an absolutely tiny village in the island. So it's a very, very peculiar context. And uh, as I said, our idea is to uh, post our interviews, uh, and they cover all of the islands apart from a tiny one, La Graciosa, where we didn't find anybody. Something else that we've done in our project, uh, developing the strategy, is uh, the significance. We, we wanted to find the main places of, well, the places of significance for uh, sexual dissidents' memory. There are already, well, plates marking this significance. 
for example, jails, which held people uh, because of their sexual dissidence, but we've also identified other places in Canarias and Tenerife, spaces which were spaces of socialization, of prostitution. For example, many trans women ended up in prostitution, just out of dire economic need then repression spaces and visualization spaces and spaces uh, where we saw the first public uh, actions by homosexual uh, groups in the Canary Islands. So we've hung a plate in all of these places explaining why they are significant. Last year, we found out that one of the plates in Parque Santa Catalina in Las Palmas had been defaced and it had been actually removed. We're going to obviously put it back up, but it's a sad sign of the times we live in. So we talk about uh, the name of the place, uh, we give the history of the place and say why the place is significant. In the, on the website, we have links to uh, audiovisual material, and something else we've been doing over the last two years is some publications. This is quite recent. Uh, it was, uh, in fact, launched last week. It is a book, Crossed Lives, Memories of Trans People from Frankism to Now. The material of this book is based on all the interviews we've held. And in this book, there are uh, personal memories. They're not individually classified by uh, classified according to themes. So we cover people's childhood, their uh, how they did at work, repression at home, uh, in the street, or, or what happened if, you know, the ones who went to jail. So it is a, a thematic organization rather than an individual one. And we will be publishing before the end of the year something else on the first homosexual movements with the transition and uh, HIV AIDS and how it affected the LGBTQ community in the Canary Islands. We've also organized different uh, meetings and gatherings over the last few years in 2020 and 2021. These uh, gatherings were held, obviously, online because of the context. But this year, we've organized a state uh, meeting together with the Ministry for Equality, with uh, representatives from different parts of Spain. And the meeting, in fact, took place last week, Thursday and Friday last week. Those are some of the participants. And uh, yeah, it was really interesting. Uh, all these uh, meetings, the previous years and this year, they're all posted on the dissidents website. So that material is always there, available for uh, the public. We also have other materials, for example, a show um, on and the Tefia agricultural colony. It has already toured the island, the islands, and we want to take it to wherever they want to see it. Uh, we are also supporting, for example, plays. There is a specific play based on Paco España, a Canary Island transformist. He was a true pioneer. And uh, yeah, there is a brief uh, play as well on Octavio Garcia, half an hour, who was on one of the people who suffered repression and uh, in Tefia, and one of the few people who spoke out while he was in jail. And we have some videos of his. And finally, we also have uh, contributed material for another memory unit, which is being organized at county council level. And with this, I finish. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'll be delighted to answer. Thanks. Thank you.
Victor Manuel. I think that was really interesting to have your vision, to have your presentation, because you uh, tackle a particular kind of repression which was very specific under uh, the dictatorship, and it is part of the definition, clearly, of the new definition of uh, victims in the new law. There is a specific chapter on the repression of uh, LGBTI people. I think the work you do is particularly important because, as you said, if you were to interview these people uh, soon, uh, well, that those testimonials will disappear, would disappear because, yeah, they're getting to be an age. It's really important for the future. And also, uh, yeah, we are aware that there's a lot of that information which cannot be published, but, well, it is there. Finally, we're going to listen to Eva Maria Garcia Barambio. She's got a degree in history and she is a technical employee at the uh, Valencia Regional Government. Good morning, all. First of all, oh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you fine. Thank you. Good morning. First of all, I want to thank the State Secretariat for Historical Memory and EUROM their kind invitation to us to participate in this international seminar. It is a pleasure to be here with you all and to learn from your projects. I'd like to start by saying that in our database program, uh, well, we are part of uh, the democratic memory policies of the regional government, which came about in 2015 with the change of government. The first step was to develop an actions policy which administratively translated into a plan for historical memory, establishing goals and main axes of action to guarantee within the regional government uh, the proper response to the claims from the victims and the claims from the Valencian society as a whole. So from the beginning of 2016, we started working frantically to develop all our action lines in order to comply with the principles of truth, justice, uh, reparation, and uh, no repetition as established by United Nations. For example, we are providing grants to municipalities and family associations to carry out projects to recover historical memory. For example, the exhumation and identification of remains from mass graves, the removal of Franco's uh, uh, remora vestiges, the uh, refurbishment of places for historical memory, also uh, hiring researchers, uh, publications, the production of audiovisual uh, documents and also documentaries and itinerant shows. There's also a yearly uh, theater uh, session and uh, we also provide quality uh, journals on memory, uh, historical memory. And we also try to create uh, historical memory on our citizens who will suffer the repression under Franco. We're also creating a website, and we are keep feeding it on all of this. We also grant prizes and awards for work done on historical memory by uh, school uh, children and teenagers in the province of Valencia. Among our main guidelines, we had the creation of a victim's office. The idea was to give the victims and their relatives the possibility of having a public administration recognize their version of the events that took place under the repression in order to dignify the victims and make them feel heard. We also wanted to work with uh, all archive sources and we wanted to link the victims or their relatives with those sources. And we want to help citizens to 
search for information about their loved ones, find where they're buried, etc. It is on this where we are finding the need to have proper, solid research tools. The victims, uh, uh, the office to provide attention to victims of the repression has a, a main seat in Valencia and it also travels to listen to citizens for whom it's hard to travel. With, at the beginning, uh, it had uh, quite a lot of success, but then in 2019, this office was closed. And then we, at the delegation, decided to continue answering citizens' claims either in person or on the phone or on internet, and we also provide counseling on where to find information. In parallel with the activity of uh, the work of the victim's office, we were aware of the fact that an important part of our task in favor of memory was focused on the compilation of historical documents. In order to do that, we began contacts with the archives of the Kingdom of Valencia, the historical archives of the Valencian community with the general Ar historical archive of the Diputación de Valencia so that they could send us information about the funds they, all, they also kept in the period uh, covering the, the uh, civil war and the end of dictatorship to um, include uh, all that information. The uh, information obtained had to be the instruments, uh, the tools for internal work to answer to the growing uh, needs of uh, all the requests and also to, put the, uh, to turn them available through our website. For the first time, the Diputación began to offer an answer to those citizens that were asking about how to find their dead uh, ancestors or how to act in order to recuperate the rest from the common uh, graves. The uh, data uh, gathering or the data collection required the efforts of the team, the team of people who at that time were two people, and now it's three. This problem was solved by hiring part-time staff with the collaboration of the uh, uh, some people, young people, and people hired through uh, different structures. Uh, we did not have a, a computer expert in our delegation. This meant that we had to use this service of computer support of the Diputación. They had to design the structure of our databases according to our needs, taking care of the management and elaborate the search modules of each one of them, devoting to this end. The result was not always ideal because in some cases their answer was that it was not their competence. This forced us to, to outsource the service. Others collaborated with us without uh, ensuring how much they could do for us considering their own workload. This generated a big amount of delay. With respect to the compilation criteria to create the different uh, databases, uh, it's worth mentioning the common element in all of them in total eight was that they contain information about people who were born in the province of Valencia. We can classify them into big groups. The first one includes those where we didn't uh, do any previous research. In this group, we can uh, see the basis of victims where data were just given to us by the authors of the research, totally uh, for free, or we obtain them through agreements or the signature of collaboration agreement or after signing agreements with NGOs non-profit NGOs. In other cases, in this same group, the database is the fruit of the reuse of information obtained of open resources in order to extract it from uh, the Valencia groups, like the, the list of um, Franco's victims published by the Catalan archive of information. Our uh, databases uh, include victims of uh, Franco's repression in the Valencian community victims of Republican victims in the Valencian community, legal and military procedures during the dictatorship, and sentences of the 
courts uh, affecting Valentians. The second group of databases includes all those other databases where we uh, started the previous research. In this class, we include those databases created with data obtained after the uh, search of uh, archives, either by the, our technicians or the staff that we had hired under our supervision. Data come from the funds of the archives of the Kingdom of Valencia, the military archives of Guadalajara, and the general archives of the Diputación de Valencia. Basis this group includes our staff of Carabineros uh, uh, Corps, Republican uh, uh, soldiers during 1936 and 1939 in Valencia, which includes Republican soldiers of all Spain's international brigadists. Uh, uh, Valencians uh, that were uh, uh, that were affected by by different uh, sources. Uh, when did, we detect the errors, uh, considering the complexity to find the place of birth of uh, inmates, and because uh, they had uh, different uh, mixed uh, both the uh, files of, uh, re of uh, inmates and and their. Uh, Oh, the officers that kept them in prison. Questions that we include in our databases uh, are that the work doesn't end with the publication, but rather it continues with the correction uh, work, correction that stems from relatives or from the work of technicians. The problems that uh, being faithful to the original documents entails, because being rigorous, oftentimes, we have to transcribe data as they are. No, even if we know that they have, they, they include mistakes. And other times uh, we make the mistakes due to the difficulty of the, the handwriting. And on the other hand, we have another problem, which is the lack of education between our databases and the request of information that we receive. <coughs> because we often re receive requests from citizens from the rest of Spain and we uh, have to focus on the victims uh, who were born or that lived in the province of Valencia, but we have answered to their needs of information, but this entails that we have to use external sources of information to fulfill our counseling service. On the other hand, the development of our work evidences the need of potentiating databases uh, on a national basis and to improve agreements signed with the Institute of History and Military Culture of the Ministry of Defense in order to allow the digitalized funds that are part of the databases can be disseminated in our website by mentioning its origin. Finally, it's worth mentioning another problem that makes it difficult to increase the number of our databases. It has to do with the lack of information on the area of Valencia and its province, lacking the unity of criteria considering the measures to, to use in order to have public access granted. We can uh, add the disappearance, lack of conservation, deficient catalog cataloging, and the lack of knowledge about its uh, origin and end in some cases. Here we can add the difficulty of access to documents and the lack of knowledge about those funds that are kept in archives and that are not accepted, acceptable for research. A sad situation considering that these documents are fundamental to build our social history favoring the repair of victims of restoring their dignity through the knowledge of truth, safeguarding the democratic memory and conveying it to the future generations. However, we uh, are expectant, considering the new law on the memory, uh, on the democratic memory, uh, in order to favor the free uh, and universal access to documents, both from victims as well as researchers and the citizenship in general, as well as all that is re related to the. Ca well, I need to drink water, she says, because I'm speaking very fast and I can hardly speak. And finally, we celebrated the creation of the census of the documentary funds for the democratic memory, uh, detailed in Article Number 27. This will be a very important tool 
in all that has to do with repression and the violation of human rights. It will require an important investment on a continuous basis for years, but without a shade of a doubt, it will be worth it. Thank you very much to all of you. Well, thank you very much, Eva Maria. And it was hard to reach the end, wasn't it? Well, to tell you the truth, uh, it's fantastic to see the, the work you've done from the Diputación, uh, considering that uh, the, the lack of support from the central state and, and from the different regional bodies. Some people talk about the Diputación de Ciudad Real and in the case of Ciudad Real and Valencia as well. Well, the creativity you've had to use uh, to create the different teams, uh, that, well, is quite uh, important. Uh, you also mentioned, and it was part of the previous uh, panel, you put this information for to be used by, by people, and people get in touch with you guys to, to be more specific, to correct errors, etc. And you also mentioned that we had to collaborate with the Ministry of Defense with all the uh, archives that they have, and that's what we are doing from the Secretary of State of Me Democratic Memory while working uh, with the Ministry of Home Affairs, the Ministry of Culture, and the Ministry of Defense. And with the respect to the census of documental funds, well, José Luis Muñoz has an embryo of that census that we have to uh, to finish to, in collaboration with the other ministries. Well, these are some of the ideas with respect to what you said before. We have the first intervention, and I believe that in the census of, of data of victims, it's so important. It's, it's, it's a challenge to integrate uh, information stemming from different sources, and also the challenge, the next challenge is to create an interface which is intuitive enough so that it can be used by the average user. You also mentioned the uh, awareness raising that all these works have that turn into real uh, virtual memory places, but that, that have an important value. You also mentioned uh, well, that these are living projects to guarantee survival that are part to eliminate some myths all that is uh, detailed and, and, and contrasted information will allow us to know our history much better and in that sense well uh, all the information is welcome here we heard about the importance of continuous supporting exhumations the importance of unifying criteria when building census mainly the state census we mentioned the specific case of repression of the LGBTIQ plus collective, which is particularly valuable because if this effort was not made, probably everything would be lost. But it's a, an archive that is well, an archive that is that is not publicized. And finally, well, it should have to do with Valencia. As I said, it's a, a, a process, an ongoing process that requires different teams and. Uh, for workers and people who are behind, it requires creativity in order to nurture these teams. We have uh, 15 minutes for Q&A session, and let me open up the, the floor. I don't know if we have our microphone around here, roving microphone, without which we cannot work. Hello, good morning. Thank you so much because it's been so interesting. Can you please stand up? Thank you. My name is Isabel Alonso from the Catalan Association of Ex uh, Political Prisoners of Frankism. It, I was very interested uh, about your information and, and your presentations. It's sad to see that in Castilla y Leon, where I was born, are so advanced. And the rest is not, maybe. I would like to ask you all some questions that will make things even more complex. The uh, uh, civil workers' uh, experience uh, that are very extensive and that uh, most of them ended up in uh, punishments. 
teachers uh, or, or train uh, it would be interesting and going to the target of Frankism I'd like to know if you've observed that or if with the situation that you have in mind it would be unacceptable and one more thing that I was interested in is the target Frank the late Frankism and the court of public order that were studied by Juan del Aguila uh, uh, the yes, extra judiciary uh, assassinations, the very high uh, uh, punishments, uh, many year sentences, the, the dictatorship was uh, dictatorship till the end, and this was reflected by the uh, court of public order, and this can be part of the databases if it's not already part of it. These are uh, sanctions or Discipline, the disciplinary actions against civil servants. You've done a great job. I'd like to thank you. Two, just two brief comments with respect to Castilla Leon. We have to be honest. From the Secretary of State, we've been collaborating with them. Before I said that, what we are doing now is to update the Common Graves map. But in, with respect to this map, we are in collaboration with the Castilla Leon and the University of Burgos did an important job, which, is, which has been uploaded on our website with the victims uh, and with the uh, common graves. With respect to civil workers, civil servants, we had a congress in Salamanca where we studied with further detail the, um, uh, the, the, the disciplinary actions in the uh, education sphere and, in, and, and during the late uh, Frankism, as we could see in the LGTBIQ plus group, they were, uh, they, well, they, they inclu it included many victims. Let me give the, the floor to, to the speakers so that they can complement their, their participation, it's on, yes. In the case of Castilla-La Mancha, the first portal that I mentioned, victims of Frankism in Castilla-La Mancha, it includes data from people that were, uh, that received disciplinary actions. This can be found in there. It's not on, no, it's on. Well, in our case, we have not approached uh, disciplinary actions of uh, staff. We have the documents, which is in the general uh, archive. But in the late Frankism, well, we could see this in the oral uh, archive, which includes 110 interviews all of them indexed and translated from Spanish to Valencian and vice versa. And there we have the, uh, well, the, the, the uh, testimony of many people who had lived in the late Frankism and people, some people that considering what my, panel, my fellow panelists after the years that we've all that have gone by, well, some people uh, are, are, are afraid because they were homosexuals and they don't really feel like talking publicly about it. But we gather some of these examples in our interviews. In the case of uh, Navar, I would like to mention some things. We focused our presentation in the uh, project of integration of all these uh, works, and it's worth mentioning that uh, we have a lot of material that is still in, in this stage of integration. The Documentary Fund of Historical Memory of the Public University of Navarre, which is a responsible body to, to undertake the research, historical research work. Well, we've worked all this in all these census and in our database, uh, we're in the, in the stage of, of, of uh, streamlining. And well, we conceptualize the re repression facts. So every person is connected to the different repression facts that could have acted, uh, purging, prison, etc. So as the research advances and progresses, well, we add more information to the database. Our idea is not to leave any repressive modality outside with respect to the late Frankism. 
And during the morning, in the first panel, we heard about it. In the afternoon, I'm sure we'll continue with it. We heard about the different terms, offering documents, etc. Obviously, this is more complex. The closer we get to the to this, well, we've been promoting some uh, interviews and oral uh, memory gathering projects amongst anti-Francism uh, anti uh, um, organizations. Some of them generated some, some PhD thesis and uh, end of the year master projects. This is a, an area that we are very interested in. In the database uh, of the documentary funds, we uh, have some of these, uh, the opinion of some of these people based on these projects. But this is still in, uh, not, not in an embryonary stage, but uh, in a more initial stage. The repression of the uh, coup d'etat uh, obviously involves a trajectory that which has lasted uh, decades, and it's more consolidated. So let's say that this project is like the end uh, of where we're going to. But there are other works that, complementary works, that have generated some reports about LGBTI plus uh, groups in Navarre or uh, the movement of uh, Depending on the availability of sources, uh, we are at that stage of uh, reports, etc. And there are other other elements. Uh, some teachers that uh, were purged uh, and that were affected by other sources, exile, etc. So all this uh, requires or, or needs to, to cover different areas of, of interest. And with respect to Galicia, the issue of uh, Parliament. Well, this is simply represented because part of the previous research, part of the database of Nomes de Voces was uh, all stemmed from other uh, works like Julio Prada, who were uh, on economic repression, or Julio Prada de Preta, uh, trying to uh, uh, dealing with uh, agri agricultural associations. But Nomes de Voces. We studied systematically the military trials up, up to the up to 1940. Well, in Galicia, I didn't say it before, but I'll say now there's an, a new agreement of uh, exhumation of common uh, graves, and many work uh, or a great deal of work work is being done about the anti franco guerrilla. This is a field that is progressing chronologically. And finally, with the funds that we mentioned before in Terra Memoria, part of the funds that are or that come from Istorga are referred specifically to the, tra the democratic transition. There is an important part of this uh, research that was mentioned previously. Well, Research will we focus on uh, different uh, reports uh, on, on social danger after the 1970s. But I was thinking about the possibility of uh, cross-referencing this data with uh, other databases of victims, where maybe there or we have different elements because we're focusing on those uh, ex on those reports. I know that there is another report, uh, such as the uh, public scandal reports, that includes a lot of work, requires a lot of work to find 10 or 12 reports of this type of dissidents. We have to look at over 1,000 uh, reports. I've, I found 190 which had to do with homosexuality. Reports uh, in other fat may be harder, but it's possible that uh, this should be worked 
specifically those that can refer to the, this type of dissidents. There was a question at the bottom. No, no, no question. More than a question is a comment. Seeing the different presentations, I believe that uh, for the data integration or creation of a state census of victims, we have a challenge uh, in the horizon. And I could see the different presentations. That is a challenge and it's an opportunity as well. The challenge is that in Navarre, they have a categorization of victims in the case of UMNA, if I'm not mistaken. They have categories and subcategories, 68 different groups. In the case of Galicia, you have some 13 different categories of victims. Castilla-La Mancha, I don't remember if you counted the different categories. In the Canary Islands, we saw a part of it of sexual violence or and the data integration of different uh, database sources where we have different categories. It's impossible to automate things. So one of the challenges will be to establish or determine which are the valid categories. The law on uh, democratic memory that was recently published and approved, I think is the first law that speaks about categories, specifying them. In the afternoon, we have a school editor, which is like a specialist of the different laws on memory. I'm not mistaken by saying this. It's the first time that a law lists the different victims' categories. So maybe it's a good starting point for the creation of the state census of victims. This may be a good starting point to take into account the different uh, University projects, uh, diputaciones, uh, uh, memorial institutions, etc., and using the, these victim categories. And it's an opportunity for the Secretary of State of uh, Democratic Memory to help uh, these projects that, as we could see, uh, one of the problems that have is, is the funding to finance this type of work. The normalization of both of victims' categories, and on the other hand, what we could see previously. The normalization of the vocabulary. Uh, tomorrow, Catalonia will make a presentation of its project. And I don't think uh, there are any databases that include the normalized vocabulary with or, or nomenclature with respect to the repression sites as Memorial Democratic and the General Directorate. So, uh, here we have a lot of work done and a lot of work to do to integrate the different uh, databases, which is a challenge, but uh, maybe with uh, some funds uh, the, from the Secretary of State of Memory uh, could be also an opportunity so that everyone with a certain degree of independence and autonomy can row in the same direction. It's not a question, but rather it's a comment. Thank you. I think it's a very good comment. Well, first of all, we should have had uh, 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 an updated law and then work. Uh, the order of reality is what it is. Well, after seeing uh, the problems uh, others had to build by building databases after uh, records uh, written by hand in Cyrillic, Greek, and, and Hebrew languages, well, after that complexity, we cannot complain about any of this. And with respect to funding, I believe that it's true that we are doing as much as possible, following different sources of, 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 of information and funding. It's true that currently uh, we're building the, this census and we're trying to gather all the levels of sensitiveness. We need to have a, 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 a clear. Uh, there is a final question, I think. Thank you, Joseph Jordan. My uh, name uh, is totally Valencian. I'm here because of my historic interest. I represent the Blue Triangle, an association called the Buchenwald Association, and Amical Mackhausen. So, connecting to all the previous uh, 
presentations and with our colleagues that talked about the political prisoners and the tribunals of public order. I would like to ask of Nafarroa if you include the people that were affected during the transition. Uh, with respect to the, 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 our colleagues from Valencia uh, and Castilla León, uh, we uh, another component that the military coup succeeded very quickly. And you had 5,000 people that were killed, etc. So there were the victims of, of uh, reprisals. Uh, in, in Salamanca, you had also intellectuals, uh, you had the university, Leon, more, more of a workers' uh, area connecting to, with those studios where there was a, a very important workers' movement. With respect to what our colleague from Castilla La Mancha said, interesting place. I'd like to ask you if uh, you have considered in this work, in this extraordinary work you've done historical memory, if you have observed the, the illegitimate character of the sentences that we are observing in, also in Catalonia, the illegitimacy of the courts that, that uh, worked uh, during many, many years. And to our colleague from País Valencia, from Valencia, I'd like to ask, that I was in Villa Fames uh, airport in Castellón, and it was uh, uh, used by the Republic of Spain when it fell in the hands of uh, the uh, Franco's army. It was occupied by them. It was used by the Condor Legion. I visited it, and I found uh, a very highly abandoned place, not very well taken care of. That seemed that. And I was trying to stay away from the historical memory. This means giving distance to historical facts that happened at the time, and there was some kind of, uh, well, you know, the fact that these guys were uh, pilots of the Republic, these other guys were pilots of the Condor Legion, is not the same because the Republic pilots uh, of the Republic was a, a legitimate uh, government, and the other guys were the rebels, according to the military code of justice. They were the rebels, but repression uh, was done the other way. Thank you very much for your work. Thank you. Diego, querías responder? Diego, would you like to? Well, uh, would you like to answer from Navarra first? Because Jose, me, would you like to? Yeah, you've got a microphone. Yes, if I may. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to just contribute a, a comment. I'm a professional at the General Directorate of uh, Historical Memory in the Regional Government of Catalonia. And uh, the presentations, your presentations from different parts of Spain, from different public bodies, show clearly that there is a huge dispersal of databases, huge scattering. When a citizen comes to us looking for information about a relative, they may have disappeared in Catalonia, and we have our own resources to look for information. And luckily, those resources have been polished and interrelated. Uh, using Dedalo, we've already heard it mentioned, and that has allowed us to uh, cross-reference uh, different data bases. Tomorrow, my colleague, Elia Mesayes, will talk about it. 
But when we have uh, cases of people who suffered reprisals or were disappeared and then taken outside uh, Catalonia, then it's it's hell. I mean, we send letters to wherever, and the answer is usually, yeah, yeah, yeah. We basically don't want to know. I mean, it's. Um, I mean, I I'm sorry, but as an answer, it's just not enough. And then these very scattered databases may show that, yeah, we need to unify them, which is what I believe is uh, being discussed here. But um, I believe uh, that things could be done better to improve our searches, to facilitate our searches. Uh, for example, when there is a search outside the administration in uh, civil society, for example, there is a website called Buscar Combatientes. I mean, when I have to look for somebody who got lost somewhere in Spain, I just Google them there, and it takes me to all the resources available. And it, sometimes it just takes me directly to the document. It's amazing. That's what I miss from the state, from the public government. I think that, you know, had they developed that resource, we wouldn't all be trying to fight our own battle. Perhaps this hub that we heard of with the Arles and archives, that's what we'd need. At least that's what I miss when I'm looking for somebody outside Catalonia. We need this kind of resource that will cross-reference what's been done everywhere in Castilla-La Mancha, Valencia, wherever. I mean, that's just my humble opinion. But at any rate, my colleague tomorrow will tell you what we are doing here. I believe our manager wanted, our head wanted to take the floor. Bueno, eh, okay, nada, quería comentar algunas cosas. Yeah, I just wanted to mention a couple of things uh, based on uh, comments we've heard. We've been working on this for some time, as you know, and I think that was partly the goal of this meeting that we've organized together with the Rom. We want to start thinking in a more executive, uh, functional manner. So a couple of comments on what you were saying and some questions as well. Our idea is that having passed the law, it's now an act, 2022, we now need to organize, uh, organize our actions with regional communities and other uh, administrative levels, obviously, but with mostly regional communities to carry out a, a, an organized uh, work. But we also need to get organized internally because within the state administration, there are different databases. Some of them are accessible, others aren't. For example, PADES, yeah, everybody can access PADES, but they work in a different way. Or there are other databases from the Ministry of Culture which work in a different way. Or the Ministry of Education, they've got a list of all the uh, educational communities, including uh, teachers from primary teachers to university, I mean, it's organized in a different way. I mean, I'm, I'm no expert in archives. I'm a lawyer, so I have to trust what the archive professionals do, because this gets really complicated. But I do know there is a lot to be done. And that's why we want to bring together all these experiences. And that's why we'll have the panel this afternoon. And then on some specific points, The Democratic Memory Act was passed a month ago. So, yeah, I mean, it's still not very well known. But for example, the uh, declaration of nullity of the sentences and illegitimacy of the bodies those uh, uh, rulings came from, uh, that's already there because that has been declared by the uh, parliament. So that is done. Then 
The concept of transition, I mean, there isn't an objective concept of democratic or political transition. The, what the law says that all victims after the 29th of December 1978, all victims are automatically included in this victim's census. And then there is a technical uh, commission with historians last uh, Friday, I believe last week, we had a seminar organized by the Confederate group of the ENCO in Unidas Podemos, the political party at the parliament representing different uh, territories because the law establishes that they can also cover victims after the 29th of December 1978 when Franco died uh, so that they can see, those professionals can see which victims can be considered uh, victims of reprisals or victims whose human rights were violated because of the situation of lack of democracy, whatever. So from the 29th of December 1978, there is another stage that they are no longer victims of a dictatorship and war. It's a different kind of work. There are different publications on this. But uh, I also wanted to say, although we have Jaime and this afternoon we'll have, sorry, tomorrow we'll have Jose Luis, uh, but we are definitely at uh, your disposal, at everybody's disposal. We're here to help with all archives. Uh, since we started working, things have changed considerably. We've had the three decisions from the Ministry of Defense of opening up all previous documentation, so not opening uh, retroactively the law on official secrets, so archives have been open. And yeah, we're there trying to help uh, everybody, um, you know, whether you represent institutions or organizations or private individuals. Thank you. Thank you. Jose Mi, are you going to answer the question? And then we have Castilla, La Mancha, and Valencia. I'll be brief because I think we're running late. In the case of Navarra, we have two acts, 2013 and 2018, which uh, mark a particular moment in time, 1978. We at the Navarra uh, Institute of Historical Memory, that's where we base ourselves on. But with the law of, uh, within the Department of uh, Peace, Coexistence and uh, Human Rights, we're also working on other time spaces and other issues. So uh, the General Directorate has launched a call for projects researching on violations of human rights. We have received different research projects for this. And then I also want to mention that in Navarra, we have law from 2022 for reparations of, for victims for political acts caused by extreme right groups and political uh, uh, figures. That body has already met three times. And from January, we expect to start receiving complaints by people who feel, feel that their rights were violated by public institutions or human rights, uh, or sorry, extreme right-wing groups. So we are going beyond the dictatorship time. We're going way beyond. And our, the, the subjects we cover are also much wider. Yeah, as for Castilla-La Mancha, I'd like to say that the portal of victims of dictatorship covers 14 categories, so completely different figure. And we establish a difference between uh, people who were prisoners of Nazi uh, concentration camps and people who died in Nazi concentration camps. But yeah, I think it is important to unify criteria for classification and accounting in graves and victims, or else it's going to be impossible to have a national census or to have a graves maps, which makes sense. And then on uh, rulings and courts, uh, 
whenever we publish something on this, we say that the rulings come from illegitimate courts. We establish a difference between people who were murdered or who were executed under an illegal court ruling, because there are also time elements. Those who were uh, killed because of a court ruling that tends to be post-war. And it's usually easier to identify those victims, the ones who were uh, executed following a court ruling. But we always specify that this is il an illegal court ruling. I mean, as if it needed to be specified, saying that this happened under Franco, but there you go. Yeah, I wanted to answer the representative from Amical, Matt Housen. Uh, we, at the regional government, have a traveling uh, show now titled uh, Frankist Victims, and it covers victims who were sent to Nazi camps. And we're also cooperating with our old Sen archives through one of their associated researchers, Antonio Muñoz, from the Rovira y Virgili University because they had different objects that used to belong to Valencian victims of reprisals, and they wanted to know whether we could help them find their relatives. And as a result of that cooperation, we held a homage to three brothers who were victims of reprisals. They were members of the French resistance, and they were captured and taken to Butzenbaum. And finally, I'd like to mention that the Villa Famese aerodrome is in Castelló, obviously, and we can only work in Valencia, so it's beyond our area of action. So we do provide funds, however, for the refurbishment and uh, the, the refurbishment and uh, for historical places, be it trenches, aerodromes, whatever. Yeah, well, sorry, if I may. The agreements of the sectorial conference, so the funding that uh, the state gives the regionals. Uh, well, this year there was a change in one of the points so that 33% of the funding that goes to memorial actions, not just exhumations, now covers everything to do with places that were either concentration camps or places of forced labor. Yes, just so that you know in your own territories, so that you know that part of the funding can also be used for this if uh, the autonomous communities uh, come to us and request funds. So we have this action plan, plan for exhumations, which covers uh, memorialization of places related to illegal burials or uh, killing places. This year, there is something new, which is uh, funds to remove um, remains of Franco's dictatorship, particularly thinking of small municipalities, which really can ill afford to remove big statues or, or the like. Excellent. Thank you. We're going to leave it here. We want to thank all the speakers. You have been brilliant in your presentations.